Hello, I'm Kendall House, and in this presentation, we're going to begin to explore William D. Hamilton's solution to explaining altruistic acts. And in doing that, we're going to discuss his concept of neighbor modulated fitness in relation to his social universe. I hope you enjoy it. This presentation is called William Hamilton's Social Universe. And as you'll recall, we left off in the last presentation discussing Darwin's special puzzle. And this had to do with the observation of cast of ants, uh, most of which were sterile and did not reproduce. So ants, in many cases, are divided into a few reproductives and the great majority who don't reproduce. And this poses something of a challenge and an interesting question uh, to a theory based on reproductive fitness like natural selection. So the basic question Darwin was posing is what's in it for the worker ants the, who don't reproduce? Um, why are they there and why do they work? After all, they're not uh, increasing their reproductive fitness. And this is basically the altruism question, the question of why living things sacrifice for others, and by sacrifice we mean reduce their reproductive fitness in order to allow others to reproduce. And that's captured nicely by the social insects. Darwin's answer, as you recall, was... Uh, that this difficulty disappears when it is remembered that selection may be applied to the family as well as to the individual. And Darwin didn't follow up on this idea in any detail. Uh, nor really did anyone else until William D. Hamilton, who in the early 1960s, a century after Darwin, um, grabbed hold of this problem of altruism and family and pursued it with great vigor. So Hamilton recently passed away in the year 2000, and one of his obituaries described him as a good candidate for the title of most distinguished Darwinian since Darwin, and partly that's because of Hamilton's focus on natural selection and his effort to apply that concept to animal behavior. So part of what Hamilton is remembered for uh, from the very beginning is his efforts to rethink the meaning of reproductive fitness. And this has two parts to it. The first he called neighbor modulated fitness. And this simply recognizes that our fitness is affected by other organisms that are around us and we affect their fitness. His second concept is called inclusive fitness. And this is captured well, as you'll see later, um, by this photo of an uncle um, helping his nephew and niece on a computer. So for this presentation, we're going to focus just on the concept of neighbor modulated fitness. Before Hamilton, fitness was generally discussed in terms of the direct reproductive fitness of individuals. This is sometimes called personal reproductive fitness. But basically, fitness in this sense is measured by how many offspring you raise to adulthood who then themselves reproduce. And of course, reproductive fitness is always a relative term. It's relative to your competitors. So what is neighbor modulated fitness? Well, it's just the idea that fitness outcomes are shaped by social interactions. And Hamilton developed this uh, in relation to two agents. We're going to use these little smiley faces, uh, purple and blue, to talk through this. Um, there are no smiley faces in Hamilton's papers. So we have two agents. We're going to call them purple and blue. And as in Hamilton's original model, we're going to keep it simple. It's one way. We're interested in the impact of what purple does on blue. So there's four possible outcomes to this that Hamilton described. And the first outcome is that purple harms the reproductive fitness of blue. And as a result of that, purple benefits. So there's two parts to this. 
One part is the benefit uh, that purple realizes through harming blue, and the other is the harm to blue. And what we're really saying here is the reproductive success of purple increases as a result of reducing the reproductive success of blue. We're going to use red to symbolize harm and reduced reproductive success, and we're going to use green to symbolize benefit and increased reproductive success. And this describes the selfish corner of Hamilton's social universe. There's four corners to it, and we've got this marked with a plus leading to a minus, and that shows that the actor benefits at the expense of the target of that action. And we could call this ordinary Darwinism. Uh, certainly this kind of behavior was in the 19th century particularly strongly identified with Darwinism. And we can find quotes in Darwin to this effect. So Darwin says at one point that throughout nature one species incessantly takes advantage of and profits by another and natural selection can and often does produce structures for the direct injury of other species. So that's from the very first edition of The Origin of Species. And thanks to the effort of Thomas Henry Huxley and others, this kind of action um, became uh, deeply associated with Darwin in the public mind. But there were more outcomes that Darwin discussed. And one of these that Hamilton developed more than Darwin is where once more purple harms blue. But this time the outcome is different. Uh, purple harms blue and as a result purple is also harmed. So in this case there's a harm to blue and a harm to purple. Everyone experiences reduced reproductive success. And Hamilton called this the spiteful corner of the social universe. So we're going to symbolize that with a negative leading to a negative to show that the reproductive success of both actors declined. And this is rather puzzling. Hamilton suggested this was the least likely corner to evolve. So spite is puzzling because it's mutually destructive. And that means it should be selected against. How do you benefit from mutual destruction? And to make a finer distinction, Hamilton defined two kinds of spite. He said, true spite is when I harm myself to harm you, and it's mutually destructive. But then there's what we can call weak spite, where I harm you with no benefit to myself. And to quote Hamilton, uh, adaptive true spite can hardly exist. It's a non-starter for important evolutionary effects. The third outcome is where purple benefits blue. So we've switched from a harmful action to a beneficial one. And as a result of this, purple also benefits. So this is the inverse of spite. And in this case, uh, both agents will turn green because both have benefited. And this means that as a result of the action of purple, the reproductive success of both actors has increased relative to their competitors. So they both come out ahead. And this is the cooperative corner of the social universe, uh, which some students of animal behavior became very excited about as the greatest problem to explain. How does cooperation arise? The question is, how does it evolve? So we're going to symbolize cooperation with the plus leading to the plus, And that gives us our third corner. Now, one possible outcome of cooperation that Darwin talked about was a co-adaptation. And he wrote at one point that I can see no limit to the beauty and infinite complexity of the co-adaptations between all organic beings. So he didn't just talk about uh, competition and selfishness. He also wrote about co-adaptation and cooperation. And the most famous metaphor here is the tangled bank of interwoven organisms that all depend on one another. The fourth outcome is that purple again benefits blue, but as a result of this, purple is harmed. So this time, uh, the action of purple increases the reproductive success of blue 
and decreases the reproductive success of purple. And this is a puzzling thing. How does this evolve? And if you think about it, this is just what we were talking about in the case of those worker ants. They were benefiting the reproductive success of the queen. Um, how was that uh, beneficial to them? That's the altruism problem. And this marks the altruistic corner of Hamilton's social universe, the fourth one. And here we have the negative leading to the positive. The, the actor uh, suffers to benefit others. And this is a puzzle. Uh, how can we win by losing? And Hamilton's answer was that perhaps the ants are not really so altruistic after all. That's the case uh, when they happen to be close genetic relatives. So we're going to explain that answer in a later presentation that you'll be watching shortly. Thank you for listening.